Tonight, the FBI issues a malware warning after that Sony attack. Twitter makes it easier to report harassment. And Stephen Hawking's new open source communication system. Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 226 for Tuesday, December 2nd, 2014. This episode is brought to you by Squarespace. Squarespace recently launched the latest version of their platform, Squarespace 7, which has a completely redesigned interface, integrations with Getty Images and Google Apps, new templates, and an incredible feature called Cover Pages. Try the new Squarespace at squarespace.com and enter the offer code TECHNIGHT at checkout and you'll get 10% off. Hello everyone, I'm Sarah Lane and let's get right into today's tech feed. So yesterday we told you about that massive breach last week at Sony Pictures Entertainment, right? The FBI has since warned U.S. businesses that hackers have used malicious software to launch a destructive cyber attack in the United States. And the agency appears to be describing the same one that affected Sony. Attacks like this have been launched in the past in Asia and, and parts of the Middle East, but none have been reported in the United States, that is, until now. The FBI report didn't say how many companies had been victims of destructive attacks, but it did explain how the malware overrides all data on hard drives of computers, including the master boot record, which prevents them from booting up. It's pretty time consuming and costly to repair a bunch of hard disks. The FBI says it's investigating the attack with help from the Department of Homeland Security, while Sony has hired FireEye's Mandy and Incident Response Team to help clean up after the attack, which also points to the severity of the breach. If you're getting these guys to come in. Now, as for the rumor that the attack might have come from North Korea, perhaps in retaliation for Sony's upcoming movie that features leader Kim Jong-un in an unflattering light, the technical section of the FBI report said that some of the software used by the hackers had been compiled in Korean, but it did not make any specific connection to North Korea, publicly anyway. Apple is finally set to go to trial on the third major antitrust lawsuit that will feature the late Steve Jobs' emails as an important role in the outcome. The latest case is set to begin on Tuesday in Oakland, California, a class action involving older iPods, which only played songs sold in the iTunes store or those downloaded from CDs, not music from competing stores. Remember that era? The plaintiffs are consumers who say that Apple violated antitrust law because to keep their music, people had to also keep iPods rather than cheaper alternative music players. Apple has since discontinued this practice. Based at least partly on emails coming from Jobs, Bonnie Sweeney, who's the lead plaintiff's lawyer, says, quote, we will present evidence that Apple took action to block its competitors and in the process harmed competition and harmed consumers. Another case set to go to trial in April and also featuring emails coming from Steve Jobs centers around a class action against Apple and other tech companies that were allegedly conspiring to keep wages down by agreeing not to recruit one another's workers. That was back in 2010. There's another one. Also in 2012, the Justice Department accused Apple and five other publishers of colluding to raise ebook prices. In that trial, government lawyers showed an excerpt from Mr. Jobs's authorized biography in which he said he wanted publishers, not retailers, to set the price of titles. Earlier this year, Snapchat unveiled GeoFilters, which is a feature that let users add image filters so that they would only show up if a recipient was in a particular location. Now, you might not even be familiar with this, even if you use Snapchat, because up until now, the feature was only available to developers. Today, though, it opens up to anyone with a Snapchat account. A user chooses the area that they want their image to show up, then they upload what image they want to display using the new community site. Now, Snapchat does note that all images must be original artwork and all have to be approved by the Snapchat team. All right, let's move our attention to Twitter, but I'm not going to do it alone. I'm going to bring in Jeff John Roberts, reporter over at GigaOM. Hello, Jeff. Hey, Sarah. Good to be here. Well, good to have you. So there was an article written uh, by your colleague, Matthew Ingram, today that Twitter is trying to stem its abuse problem with new reporting tools. This has been a really hot button issue, uh, not only because of some high profile cases of, of people uh, feeling harassed and stalked using uh, Twitter or, and other social networks, but because the reporting system was always... It seemed a little clunky. It seemed uh, not not super easy to use, even if you wanted to participate. So how have they streamlined the process? Um, they've made it easier to report uh, on a mobile device, which most people use for Twitter these days. 
I think they've expedited it. So if you want to block someone creepy, it's a lot faster than it used to be. You used to have to fill out a questionnaire. Now it's sort of a one-touch thing. And theoretically, it's supposed to block or ban users a lot quicker. And the blocking feature itself, um, there's the reporting people, but there's also simply blocking, tuning them out and making sure they can't see you. That's more comprehensive as well. So my understanding, this isn't earth shaking, but it's a sort of step in the right direction. So the block feature then has actually changed because I know it used to confuse folks. Sometimes they think, oh, I want to block this person. I'm, I'm, I don't want to see their content or they're harassing me. But that didn't necessarily turn you, you know, dark or make your account locked to anyone from the outside world. So is, has that feature been changed as well? My understanding, yes. I mean, not only do you not see their creepy stuff, they can't see you, which I think is an improvement. So and it also, it that harder. seems to mirror what a lot of other social networks do as well. You know, if, if I block someone on Facebook, because I've kind of tried this out a few times, they might be commenting on things. I just don't see that it's as if they don't exist. And the, yeah, exactly. and the same goes for me as well. Yeah, that's, that's my understanding. It's going to mirror more what happens on Facebook and so on. So, okay, we've got a streamlined process to report harassment, um, a better blocking tool. So let's say, uh, let's say I've got somebody who's, who's bothering me and I decide to flag them. How long until that person, provided that they're actually doing something that, that is deemed harassing, gets taken down? Is there a certain amount of users that also have to that flag that person? What is the process? I think they've improved the signals. And now, if I understand right, it's also the first time third parties can come in and report people too, which will move it up their priority chain. But you have to look at it from Twitter's end to a single report. Apparently, I'm not a teenage girl, I, you know, obviously, but apparently one of the things there is as a tactic, if someone is dissing Justin Bieber, the believers will go and, you know, all gang up and urge uh -huh. that person to be blocked. So there's a lot of kind of, you know, noise in the midst of the signal. So my understanding is they're pulling in new sort of aggregating new forms of information to try to streamline it and make it faster. How it actually works on the ground, we'll have to see how it plays out. There's been a lot of criticism against Twitter, particularly for not doing enough in the past to protect its users, uh, you know, uh, making Twitter a safe place. Um, I, I know I've had personal issues with it. Many of, uh, you know, my peers and colleagues have as well. How far does Twitter have to go to ensure that do you think that this tool, I guess I'll phrase it differently. Do you think that this tool is the beginning of, of, of more of a safety measure that Twitter has to roll out? Or does this seem sufficient? I, I think you probably always have people who say, well, I don't feel safe enough. Uh, but does this feel like Twitter has, has made the right decision? Uh, I'm torn on this one because I'm a pretty strong free speech advocate. And Twitter isn't simply kind of a community or a social network or a kind of hobby thing. It's also a very powerful broadcast platform. It's, you know, it's an essential communications medium. So, and in the past, I think to Twitter's credit, they've taken a very sort of strong advocacy for free speech and err on the side of too much speech, which can often be a good thing. That said, from my perspective, I don't have a problem with creepy people on Twitter. Mm -hmm. However, all of my female colleagues do. So I think the people who sort of design it or might call the shots might be a bit blinkered to that at times. And I'll be interesting to see how or if it's possible to create sort of a less stalkerish, harassing Twitter while also preserving the important news and public speech functions it has right now. Very good point. Very well said. Uh, this is a rollout, right? So I, I might use, uh, I might have this, you might not. Is this going to be rolled out to everybody fairly soon? Yeah, that's my understanding. It'll start showing up in, you know, this week and more and more people will get it. However, Twitter keeps emphasizing they're going to keep iterating this and tweaking and improving and things like that. So I think we'll sort of know if it's better or not probably, you know, sometime in January. Well, it certainly seems like Twitter's moving in the right direction to keep everybody happy, whether it's a free speech uh, side of things, advocacy, or as you said, many people that you know who generally feel like they're being harassed and unsafe. It should be a good uh, playing field for all. Jeff John Roberts reports for GigaOM. Thanks so much for joining us, Jeff. And before we let you go, remind folks where they can keep up with your work. Uh, you can follow me at Jeff John Roberts on Twitter and come come by GigaOM to see the latest on uh, tech and broadband stories. Oh, excellent. D to the office, I'll just come on by tomorrow, maybe grab some coffee and a Danish or... Yeah. Come on down. I have to <laughs> block you. Just just once, though. If you keep doing it, I'll have to block you. Touche. Thanks, Jeff.
Thanks, Sarah. Have a good one. You too. All right, coming up, the new open source communication system developed by Stephen Hawking and Intel. And Apple wants your iPhone to have cat-like reflexes. Yes! It's not exactly what it sounds like. First, though, we want to thank Squarespace.com for sponsoring this episode of TN2. Squarespace is the all-in-one platform that makes it easy to create your own professional website or online portfolio. I've been using Squarespace for... Oh, many moons. I mean, probably about seven years now. I've had lots of different designs. You know, sometimes I just get in a mood and I want everything to look different. And it's quite easy to do that. And Squarespace 7 makes getting started or, you know, sprucing up your website a bit easier than ever. Squarespace 7 allows you to live edit on one screen. That means you're not toggling between two different screens, like preview mode and checking your work. It's all in one place. Also, device mode helps you preview designs to see how your design is going to look on tablets and mobile and desktops and you know, all of the different sizes of, of computers that someone might actually access your site. You have instant access to professional stock photography. That's a huge bonus. Getty Images. So this is like the best stock photography out there for just $10 each. Squarespace also has designed category-specific templates. That really is going to cater to a lot of people in different industries. Musicians, architects, chefs, just to name a few. Now, the Horizon template is very nice. It's laid out for bands specifically. And when you click through, you know, whether you're a band or just kind of interested in how it's laid out, you've got tour dates and a music player and a merch store. That's all built in for you. You don't have to build that yourself. You can customize it if you want, but you certainly don't have to. E-commerce is available for all subscription plan levels as well, including the ability to accept donations. And it starts at just $8 per month. That includes a free domain name if you sign up for a year. It's mobile ready. The Squarespace portfolio, note, metric, and blog mobile apps are all extensions of your website you can you can access anything on the go any change make any changes from anywhere and note and blog apps are now on android as well so android users are going to be happy about that hosting is included that's important because squarespace takes care of everything you don't have to worry about paying for hosting or managing that with some other registrar now you can start a free two-week trial right now or you know whenever you feel like it but two week trial with no credit card required it really is free you can start building your website and have a lot of fun over the next two weeks when you decide to sign up for squarespace make sure to use the offer code tech night and you'll get 10 percent off and you get to show your support for us to begin using squarespace 7 existing customers just go to the settings tab and activate all the new features so if you're already using squarespace it's almost as if you've got a whole new tool right at your fingertips. We thank Squarespace for their support of Tech News Tonight. Squarespace, start here, go anywhere. All right, on to a few more stories that we're following today on TN2. Sprint wants you to switch from AT&T or Verizon. Those are U.S.'s two biggest carriers. And join the good fight. That is what Sprint says. Well, they didn't call it that. I did. Today, the carrier announced a new cut your bill in half limited promotion that promises customers will pay half their normal billing rate if they make the switch to Sprint. That's quite a promise, isn't it? Potential customers can bring in an AT&T or Verizon bill, whatever your latest bill was to show what you're paying into any of Sprint stores, or they can upload a copy of their current bill to Sprint's website. From there, the company pledges to cut a Verizon or AT&T customer's existing rate plan in half. Now, under Sprint, your plan will include unlimited calling and texts, and the carrier promises to find a data tier that, quote, most closely matches the data allowance in your current monthly rate plan. Aha! Therein lies the rub. It's not great for unlimited data folks who don't want to get rid of unlimited plans. It's hard to switch when you've got that, right? Also, no on-contract pricing, so your new phone has to be purchased through Sprint's leasing program, easy pay, installment billing, or bought outright. You also have to trade in your current AT&T or Verizon smartphone if you move over to Sprint. And if you're porting a family plan, phones must be provided for each line that's coming over. There are some restrictions, clearly, but it might be a money saver for you worth looking into, at least if you're interested in jumping ship. Valve is moving into video game streaming with a new broadcasting feature for Steam, which launched in beta today. The feature will let Steam users watch other people play games without leaving the service. Does that sound familiar at all? 
I bet it does. Valve uh, advertises it as a way to watch friends play with a click of a button, but there's also a public option that lets anybody view a game stream, which sounds a lot to me like what Twitch offers. Yeah. Users can choose the Steam client or they can access the feature from either Chrome or Safari browsers. For now, broadcasts are only available live, so you can't share your streams for, for people to watch later, at least not now. And in order to use the feature, you'll need to sign up for the beta version of Steam. All right, you've seen Professor Stephen Hawking speak through a computer. Today, Intel unveiled a new open source system that they developed in conjunction with Dr. Hawking called Assistive Context Aware Toolkit, or ACAT. The system is designed for over 3 million people worldwide who suffer from quadriplegia or a motor neuron disease. Now, with technology integrated from SwiftKey, yeah, you might know SwiftKey from their third-party keyboard apps, but they do other stuff too, Hawking is typing 20% fewer characters overall, which saves him time. His typing rate has doubled, and he's seen a 10x improvement in common tasks. Hawking says, quote, my old system was over 20 years old and I was finding it very difficult to communicate effectively. This new system is life changing for me and I hope will serve me well for the next 20 years. Since the system is free and open source, both he and Intel hope it will be used by researchers who will develop new solutions for those with disabilities. Finally, Apple and cat lovers finally unite as one. Ah, this is the best day of my life. In the never ending pursuit to prevent your smartphone from cracking when you drop it, it's happened to all of us. It's happened to me more times than I'd like to admit. Apple just received approval from the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office on a system to give your iPhone or iPad kind of cat-like reflexes. We all know how cats almost always land on their feet during a fall from a high distance, right? Using the onboard gyroscopes and accelerometers and GPS, the new protective mechanism in the device would know conceptually anyway, when it was in free fall and then used the vibration motor to reorient itself to protect the screen. The patent details other repositioning methods like extending airfoils and deploying gas canisters to control the landing. It sounds a little nuts, I know, but consider this. Amazon CEO Jeff Bezos patented a smartphone airbag system just three short years ago. Now, only if they would get to work on a gravity-defined phone to go with our hoverboards... Nobody would ever have to drop anything again because we live in the sky. And that is it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. You can subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash TN2. And I really hope you do, by the way. If you don't, I'll know and I'll be really disappointed and you'll get a lump of coal in your stocking. You can write us at TN2 at twit.tv and you can watch live every weekday at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern Time. And of course, don't miss our morning news program. That's Tech News Today, tomorrow and every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. I'm Sarah Lane. See you tomorrow and thanks for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by CashFly.com.